Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar today. This is Prakash Rafik. I would like to hear about 27 attendees. And I have a feeling that we wait for a while now to carry on. In general, are you people able to hear me well? Just take a look at it. Yeah, so. I think now it's 28, so maybe we make a big difference, right? So, as I said in the past, this is pretty much the idea for basically introducing you to the track of fostering innovative leadership. The track uh, will be very much involved in today's conference, uh, and the schedule of the conference is probably coming to you, so we will have it with you. Uh, what happens is, many times, Selecting the track uh, becomes a little difficult because there are only eight tracks. So we thought it's all the more reason to give you some introduction, some things of that, those who are attached to entrepreneurship, innovative entrepreneurship, and then fostering innovative entrepreneurship. Uh, me and my colleagues have put in a lot of effort to make this as good as reachable to you as possible. So let me make a beginning. I will take about five ten minutes, after which I will further give it to and Dr. Gopal Nakhali, who is the grandest from the US, is already here in, right at morning 5 o'clock. So, welcome one of you. Let us just begin. The focus point of this in the session that we go is on pre-implementing the topics to content which will be workshop and deliberation during the conference at UAT between 10 and January, and particularly for this fact, is fostering innovative entrepreneurship. Uh, how do we go about triggering, stimulating, and nurturing the young minds of engineering students by specifically educating them with the background information on entrepreneurship, do's and don'ts, success and expenses? It's like towards fostering and sprouting innovative effort in their entrepreneurship skills, towards better growth, and the direction of the study. Uh, we are here as of now, we just be more speakers. And the speaker who are joining now, uh, who is joining directly at the conference, one Ravi is with us in China, and he will be joining directly at the conference. And I take some few minutes to read the abstract and read his profile. Professor Ravi Sivakati is the assistant professor at the University of Toronto and his presidency in India was many and he had to agree on the international accessibility process. He is a convener at the UPC Institute of the World University in Task Force 14 last year's Soviet Union. I think you can see a lesson for it and so many other things about their society. We also share the working community of artistry smart here. He is an invited speaker in the international smart grid area, having co-authored over 60 technical centers. He is also mentored to share a smart technology company called Biosiders. Biosiders is a professional in energy efficiency and other skills like nano and micro grids and so on. Retired in 2014 after 31 years of career in leading university in Canada, where he managed leading portfolio in managing innovation, smart grid projects, energy storage, renewable energy integration, and asset management. His past corporate relationship includes Tyson University, TV Ontario, and so on. He has received numerous, numerous honors. He was of two world founders and citizens, including Queen Elizabeth Diamond City, Medal of Twenty Twelve, Fellow Canadian Academy of Engineering Twenty Twelve, and so on. He has done his research from IIT Bombay, IIT Kharagpur, and then Masters in Electrical Power Institute in Kolkata. This was the Canadian team, and I did the research. Uh, that's like a brief profile of him, which is coming in here in the next 
Sir, can you speak a little louder? So, innovation, global. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, please speak a little louder. Oh yeah. Uh, we are going to the slides. I hope you are able to see the slides. Innovation, global scenario, country by score, and treasury of scoring. I'm just running through this slides fast just to give the idea that where does India stand compared to all the countries? So, like innovative capacity of the country, there are Eight pillars of measurement, which are innovative capacity of the country. Five of them are inputs, three of them are outputs. What are those inputs and what are those outputs? Those inputs are on here, institutions and policies, human capacity, general and IC infrastructure, business, markets and capital flow, technology and process of Further to that, the outputs, outputs are based in knowledge, competitiveness and value. These are not just the two points put in the top list. There's a valuation done and the ranking is done. And thereby, when you find the top ranking positions in respective countries for the respective social adjustments and strengths like inputs and outputs. So they're all here. These are mostly Singapore, Denmark, and the US, and things of that kind. Beyond that, there are geographical leaders like who is best in Africa on a particular part. Who is best in Europe and who is in the US? That's how the scoring of your uh, US 5.8 by 10, Asia Pacific, Japan 4.8 by 10, which comes after integrating several inputs and outputs to stand. And beyond that, the total ranking for all the countries, including, of course, India, stands at some level, but mainly three innovation, innovative capacity, and uh, something like a scoring of 3.67 by 10. If you were stopping at 5.8 by 10. Um, so this is on this kind of a document for global innovation in index. Uh, also, we could view it, view it from the GDP basis. This would be the field of where again India stands, and here it is. Uh, India stands on the rank number 10 at GDP, with about $2.05 billion. All this is the direction of how innovation can lead the country. I mean, Possible backup to the bank. Right? So, here is the total GDP of the US from 78.52 to billion, here in the US 2.05. But in spite of that, there are several pluses like this. I also felt like giving some deal for MSMEs, both in developing countries like Germany and the developed countries like India. Uh, sort of other way around, developed countries like Germany and developing countries. Uh, this is the way it goes for Germany because I found the data for Germany has been very neatly done and as many as close to 99.95 percent of the industry and as many as 3.67 million are uh, SME, while only about 800 companies are large the company. And this gives the feel of what kind of strength the SMEs have in the relationship. So the Indian scenario goes like this, it will be not only small and medium, it's also micro, small and medium. And that talks about something like 2.5 million, 1 million for micro and up to about 100 million for the manufacturing sector for medium. And this is showing the growth of it. I mean, it's grown in about 10 million. The good number is we are talking about something like 4.6 crores of the as well as 2013 and as well as 10 crores in 26 crores of technology. This is the way it's going more serious the overall GDP. The party is going to be the GDP. So, 
I thought it seems to be right around the speed where we go about talking to the other speakers. This is a better point. This wants to make the point that the interpretation is leading to a substantial contribution to the economy and it is as big as the expectation of the last few years, especially with jobs as it has been Roles of the industry and as it is, four point seven roles of emission is a piece of us. That kind of thing, having handed the work to the police and Ashoki here with me, I want to say, Mr. Chief of the Yeah, can I get the control to the? Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, yeah, transfer the control to the police. It looks like I got it. Wonderful. Uh, th thank you very much, Professor Bapat, and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I guess uh, Professor Bapat's voice was a little bit unclear because of maybe some mic issue there. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, what is the idea of this uh, one day workshop. Uh, I think there was no better time than this one to really foster entrepreneurship in India. And that can happen only if we work in the technical institutes. And so that's the basic uh, you know, the reason now to, to conduct this workshop. Now, if you want to do that, there are two parts to it. One is developing capability, capability of students, of the institutes, and of the entrepreneurs who are coming out of the institute. And second is marketing that thing. So broadly, this thing will be divided into two parts. One is how to develop capability, which me and uh, you know, Ranade will cover. And second is how to market that, which Dr. Nadkarni would cover. And the third element that we are adding is how these things are happening in one of the leading economy in the, in the world, which is Canada. And for that, we are getting uh, Mr. Ravi Sitapati. He is a very you know, uh, accomplished person. He is involved in many academic institutes in Canada, as well as he is involved in the industry also. In fact, he was playing different roles in industry, and along with that, he was on different bodies of academic universities, such as the University of Toronto and Western University, London, Canada. Okay, so that's the broad, you know, architecture. So we'll just give a brief of what we intend to do in that around five hours workshop. So the first part is, as I said, that capability. Okay, in that broad plan for that particular session would be why is innovation required, why is entrepreneurship required, and why we're talking about innovative entrepreneurship. Then why we should be focusing on the colleges and especially technical colleges and what requires to become a successful entrepreneur, what is that we need to do for that thing in the colleges and what can we teach for that thing. And you know we cannot keep on adding more courses and more credits because that's going to you know, load our students that much. As it is, as I understand, that Indian system has perhaps one of the you know, highest number of credits. Adding more is not going to help much. They would be just you know, tick marking different areas that they have learned, but they would not have gotten really the deeper meaning of those areas. So what we are proposing is that without burdening the system, how we can integrate what is required to become successful entrepreneur into the existing system. And we believe it can be done. It can be done with, with minimal, minimal overhead and overload. And for that, we also will give you a case study of what we are saying should be done. You know how that can be done in a particular system. Uh, outcome of the session should be that all of you people who attend that should be able to explain why is new entrepreneurship required. You know is more important in the engineering colleges in, in India. How to assess and develop potentially success successful entrepreneurs. Because you may be aware that you know the number of people who get into in entrepreneurship and number of people who succeed, both these numbers are not very encouraging. In the sense, even at global level, there could be only 5% people who, you know, who get into entrepreneurship. And only perhaps maybe some 25% of them succeed. So therefore, it may be due to a particular mindset, particular type of attitude that is there, which is inherent in individual. So everybody may not be able to succeed. While we believe that there are certainly more people who can succeed and should be able to get into you know, entrepreneurship, but we don't need to push everybody there. And therefore, we should be choosing people who can get into that. Okay, there are different assessment methods for that thing, and we'll talk about them. At least we have come across three, four different very complete assessment methods, the others which are in pipeline, and you know, we'll talk about what are the possibilities. 
after that um, we will talk about as I said how to integrate entrepreneurship in, in the engineering degree curriculum and now how do we assess capability of an institute to develop entrepreneurs so this is the four outcomes that you know we want to achieve as a part of uh, this session so uh, you know the world is changing significantly I mean that way we are in a very good time there are so many things which are happening in a positive way if you just look at simple life expectancy it has been growing uh, almost exponentially for last uh, 50 years uh, in, in all the countries in India it has become about 64 years for female and 62 for males and in fact I, I was told by one of my friend that if you live up to 2029 20, then chance that you will die is almost not there because by that time the medical technology will progress so much that for whatever disease you will get into there will be some solution you know, which can which can keep you alive okay so uh, besides that if you look at uh, you know if you look at for example cost of information has reduced significantly I mean how, how difficult it was to manage information using you know computers in say 1950s and 60s I mean all, all of you may be aware that we used to have a mainframe computer which used to occupy a big big hall and all that capacity can be there in our normal so a smartphone. A telecommunication cost has gone down significantly as, as uh, uh, late as 1990s. I, I know that uh, when we used to go to the United States and you know when we used to call India it used to be like maybe something like uh, 100 rupees per minute. Okay and now it has almost like you know on Skype we can not only speak but we can also see people. Uh, cost of transportation again has you know gone down significantly and cost of power also has gone down significantly. So I mean all these are you know marvels of engineering all these things are possible largely largely because of people in the engineering okay now so job well done greatly done actually but it is far from finished because there are many you know it's normally that when we solve problem we create still bigger problems and that's what that's what has happened while we have solved many problems but that has created bigger problems okay and now look at total population that's you know increasing expectancy have gone up the birth rate has gone up at least in the developing countries and therefore you can see that the population also is almost rising exponentially and which means that we have to worry about meeting food needs of all these people water needs health education security employment and this problem is not isolated to a particular part of the world it is going to the world is so much now connected that a problem in Africa can impact other countries including India and including United States and so on and so forth and I just given few slides and I have you know um, a minimum slide to talk about the situation which is gray on this front but I'm just just talking about uh, what is the issue on the hunger and unfortunately it shows that India is at the top in a, in, a, in a negative sense that we have more issues that more people who are remaining hungry at the end of the day and overall in the world we are seeing that 95 million pretty much like you know one seventh if you take total population of 7 billion almost like 1 billion people of them are remaining hungry as of today and this number is actually you know uh, is going up especially in the developed, uh, developing countries the on a, on a lighter side uh, uh, this is what's happening uh, the, uh, we, we have been hearing news about pollution in Delhi pollution in uh, Beijing but uh, you know, people aren't obviously uh, you know be able to change their uh, uh, their habits, and we also have heard about what Arvind Kejriwal is trying to do in Delhi and how how people are responding to that in a very sarcastical fashion. So, uh, so, so this thing uh, will, will will be difficult to manage. And in fact, you know, if all the insects from the plant disappear, there will not be any life on the planet after 50 years. And if all humans disappear, life will flourish in 50 years because the human being is the one who is you know in that sense trying to really you know create uh, imbalances and disequilibrium in the in the in the system uh, another example of that thing it's a polar bear and it's finding hardly any place to uh, to be at its home which is ice and uh, we have seen again what has happened in Chennai what had happened in Mumbai that is something similar about uh, you know 18 years back so all those things are causing you know huge difficulties and only way we can solve them is through innovation. There's no other way that we can sort out these difficulties. We obviously can't give up. Uh, we have to work on them, and the only way to work on them is innovation, which is you no know, can be simply defined as 
fresh thinking, creative thinking, which can add value to the customers. In this case, the customers is in that sense the whole planet. Okay, how can I add value? How can I think differently? And how can I add? How can I come up with different ideas? You know, screen them, develop them, give solution, and take them to the people who need those solutions and deliver value to them. Now, so once you think of these things, different you know uh, solutions. Now we have to also think of uh, the last item that delivering value, and for that we need to entrepreneurship. So it undertakes innovations and transform them into economic goods. So you know, I could show that I can add value to a particular you know segment of customer or customer base, and my innovation would end there. But then taking it out and scaling it up so that everybody possible can benefit from that thing. From that point, entrepreneurship can start. Okay, so it undertakes innovation and transform them into economic goods. And uh, there are three important things you know that are part of you know, entrepreneurship. One is obviously it drives economy. There's a lot of data which has come from the United States which indicate that how entrepreneurs are changing the economy. Now, when I start my business and I mention about different challenges which are there. I, I, I just can't do, for example, what the General Motors is doing. I don't know what is GE is doing. I'm going to look at some problems which are not yet solved and solve them and launch my enterprise. In that sense, you know, entrepreneurship would involve coming up with great solutions for the problems which are there. And when somebody does that thing and somebody solves you know, problems and provides you know, great solution, then that person would get huge personal satisfaction. That there was this particular issue, I solved that thing, I'm helping people. At, at the same time, I'm also, you know, getting money out of that thing. So in that sense, this is like, you know, a cycle which is, you know, which can start from any point and which can end at, end at any point. At the economy, providing that solution and having personal satisfaction. <laughs> um, uh, this is one of the, you know, very useful slide I, I feel which can tell you the extent of the difficulties that we are facing. So uh, uh, this Amrish Bhai, he is, uh, it may be, you might have heard of him, Mr. Amrish Bhai Patel, he is a Chancellor of NMMS University. Uh, he also uh, is a very well-known politician who is involved also in the education uh, ministry. So he said that India was a billion people in 2000, it would be 1.65 billion people in 2030. So we took 2000 plus years to add to be 1 billion and we just take another 30 to add 650 million, which is 65% 60, of that number. Then he said that the, the first decade of this century, 2001 to 11, was the best decade for the Indian economy. We clocked 7% plus annual, uh, per annum growth, but we we added only 130, it's not 13, 130 million jobs and added only added to 15 million children. So the best not able to keep pace with the jobs, you know, that are required, and if we don't provide for jobs for all these people, if you don't provide the, you know, something for the health, education, security, the stumbling by says that they will not allow us to live, forget about happy. So it, it's just going to create, you know, a social unrest because they, they will not, they, they will not have a job, they won't know what to do, so they will just cause social unrest. And how this can be tackled, I mean, suppose, you know, we agree at this point of time that yeah, we need to, India need to go for, you know, entrepreneurship. So the, a study has been done, I think it was by Ernst and Young, uh, to indicate the study uh, D20 economies to find out that how different countries are placed with respect to the development of entrepreneurs. And interestingly, India is doing very well as compared to others in the entrepreneurship culture. You know, the, the blue line here is uh, India and uh, you know, red or the what you maroon, I guess, is the average of all other countries. So India is doing very well in terms of culture. Okay, however, it is doing very bad in terms of the education and training, in terms of R&D spending, in terms of scientific and technical general article, and that's where again we believe that, you know, this is the area which needs maximum attention at this point of time, that we understand that innovation is important, we understand that entrepreneurship is important, and we understand that we are culture, but we don't have proper education and training for the students to become entrepreneurs, and that's where, you know, we are the engineering faculty community have to step in and do something about that. And so what requires to be a good entrepreneur? So, you know, as I said some time back, we need capable institutions which can develop capable students and which can build capable startups. Okay, so that's a simple uh, simple kind of pyramid. And how this can be done? So we are saying that uh, just focus on the central block. It's a four-year engineering degree program. 
In that, we want to do the ongoing assessment. Then we want to have different entrepreneurship practice courses. We want to have exponential technology that are being taught, exponential learning like projects and hacking and competitions. Okay, this can be done by college resources like faculty, college faculty, and I think they are the one who can really make huge difference. Student community, and I think many students. I mean, uh, we, you know, which places I have worked, I found that you know, students in the second year and sometimes in the first year can think of great ideas and launch viable enterprises. Okay. Beside that, you can take help of alumni, and we could then campus linked, you know, incubators. Okay. Uh, this, you know, this is like the resource set which is uh, easily available to the college. Beside that thing, they can rely on association of the industries, like for example, Professor Barpet is working for ISA and is spending so much time, you know, on activity like this. Uh, Professor Vanade is, uh, you know, director of the IIT Alumni Canada. He's spending so much time on this. We can talk with industry leaders, government programs, venture capital, AICT. We also can obviously rely on our other other colleagues, uh, Dr. Natkan is uh, from Mississippi background in the United States and he's involved so much in this and we also mentioned about Mr. Ravis property. Okay, now with this, you know, there are different, you know, uh, you know on the left side we are given different paths which are there. Just forget about all the paths, just look at the startup path. So we want to focus on the startup path, we want to see that how we can, you know, manage a four year program so that we can involve elements which are mentioned here with the help of college resources and with the help of ecosystem resources so that we can get capable entrepreneurs. Now, what is capable entrepreneurs? They, they should be competent. What is competency? Competency is having knowledge, having skill and having attitude. Obviously attitude is most subtle, difficult after that thing that is on the higher level and knowledge is somewhat easier. Okay. So, Developing students, and we're going to some examples. When you say attitude, you know, it means what? It means passion. It means vision. It, it, it means honesty. It means confidence. Skills means you know skills to communicate, manage people. Okay, and knowledge is you know managing finances, uh, finding out business opportunity, and then we would need uh, an incubator like a scaffolding, which will allow these students to start their business. You know, for, uh, wherein they can. You can rely on advice, uh, advice and support of uh, the faculty and other, you know, elements from the ecosystem. And then we hope that with this they can launch, you know, very successful and robust startups. By keeping all this into mind, the actual framework, which uh, I guess uh, we will just show here, but we'll describe in detail, and we'll also show that. Uh, to all the participants that how this framework can be implemented in their curriculum. Sometimes it could be appealed in your you know, college and they have to go by what university has said that. That also will show that how this can be done. It may not be you know, possible to do it 10%, but what the best that we can do you now we could show. If it's autonomous college, it's obviously somewhat easier, so that also we can show. So the framework would be broadly based on these four elements. One we are saying is that project-based learning. Because project-based learning uh, is like a panacea for most of the things which are required in engineering education today. Okay, the different you know uh, uh, variation to that. I also came across that entrepreneurial mindset learning. Even that kind of learning is coming up. Subject-based learning, case-based learning, inquiry-based learning, etc. So for for the sake of simplicity, let's focus on problem-based learning. Easier to implement. Anyway. Generally, in the final year, we can take them down to the third year, second year, even I guess in the first year, and they they should be done not in a particular discipline but beyond discipline. They should be in you know, an interdisciplinary project because they get huge amount of learning to the students. Career option beyond traditional, you know, instead of just thinking of becoming, uh, you know, a corporate employee, it's good if people can start thinking right in the college colleges to establish their enterprise. There's a very nice book by Dr. Pinkett on campus CEO. And it tells people that how they how they can how they can benefit a lot by being CEO right on the campus. And the ample examples. Uh, we have to do benchmarking and understand that how different institutes are doing. And the framework suggests that we could be benchmarking at the college level in the second year, at the you know, city level in the third year, and at the national level in the fourth year. And again, as I said, I doubted that assessment is an important part that it may not be viable, might not be right to push everybody onto this particular path. So, we have to keep on doing assessment. Now, unfortunately, there is no 
full proof assessment measurement frequency instrument or framework okay so we we'll have to keep on doing it on ongoing basis so we can do that thing we can understand that what are the development area that you know the, the student has to undertake and then maybe after 6 months after one year we can keep on doing assessment again and again to find out that whether the you know student is going in the right direction or not so we are proposing as a part of the framework that doing this assessment once in a year after they go through different kind of experiences through different courses through different pedagogy okay so that, that that's what the framework suggests uh why we can in the college and you know next topic uh, that you know ranade will uh, will cover so ranade over to you uh okay so let me start from where the is that finished so uh, let's assume that you know we have all agreed that this concept we should have to be a part of the engineering curriculum and we are all also the four year engineering degree program so uh, we have thought about it as to how this can be done let's first start with why it is important that the college should think about uh, integrating entrepreneurship so uh, we have already seen the technology that going at exponent speeds uh, uh, pradeep already took some example from that uh, that is resulting in the economy that changing at unprecedented rates and the type, because of that actually we are seeing that the type of occupation that engineering students are now going into are typically instead of Uh, more people going for purely employment oriented occupations after their degrees there there are the proportion of students who are now choosing to become entrepreneurs is increasing day by day there is also changing expectation from so many from all the people from the uh, uh, from the government and all the other uh, from all the other society and they expect colleges to actually now not just teach students to become uh, good employees of the large corporations but they expect that they become now the entrepreneurs and we should also see that in fact there is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity that getting created which never happened in the past so the graduating students uh, they are expected to become entrepreneurs and there is also tremendous new opportunity available for them as entrepreneurs the another aspect is that if we have to really uh, there is this new economy which is going to need a lot of entrepreneurs it's only the young people who can really fill that gap because it's the young people who are best suited for absorbing these brand new technologies and really convert some new startup based on that so uh, what is the change you change is occurring so what I just mentioned integrated circuits. It has gone up from integration of one, uh, gone up up to 2.5 million gigs, and now it is integrated. The internet usage has gone up, mobile usage. So all these, all these different areas, the changes are happening. And the surprising thing is that it is not just one or two areas where this new change is occurring. It is occurring all over. There are, there are so many different areas where this exponential growth is happening. Now, uh, uh, let's so let's quickly go over to what can we teach in engineering college. Okay, now first of all, we have we have concluded that okay, there is uh, there is a need to integrate, and then the next question will come is that okay, we are we are teaching students engineering subject. What can we teach to these students? as far as entrepreneurship is concerned the question will start as to can entrepreneurship be really taught that is where you will find many people starting with and to answer that actually we have tried to identify multiple types of courses or the training training modules that we can actually introduce at different levels of engineering degree uh, like first and second term we can do 
lot of preparative work which will include some overview courses. It should include courses or activities which will help students to identify their path. You know, those who really have the aptitude for entrepreneurship, they should be able to identify that they can really take up entrepreneurship as a career option, right, in the first year. We can have lots of motivational talks, teachers, or such classes, which will actually inspire students to become entrepreneurs. The, in, the, in the third semester, we call it conception stage, and when we look at the uh, actual framework, you will see where exactly the steps is. And during the conception, elaboration, and transformation stages, we can uh, we have identified there are four different types of course modules that can be introduced. Um, one is about the entrepreneurship practices, second is the technology top up, third is the business funding courses, and the fourth is um, and the fourth are the uh, are the different types of business scenarios which will disrupt the economy. Uh, the complete list of such courses and what it can be, all of such will be presented in our uh, workshop uh, at that point of time. It's a list of almost 100 different course modules which you can introduce. Uh, the next is, let's look at what type of a framework that we are proposing. So, during the semester first and second, the students should get basic entrepreneurship awareness, they should get motivational kind of inputs, they should get, they should be able to listen to a lot of success stories of other entrepreneurs, it will all inspire them and try to help them understand which, whether they can really commit themselves for taking up, uh, taking up entrepreneurship as a, as a career path. You can also have some activities like, you know, they can do certain things by which they can build their leadership skills, they can have some activities where they learn about team learning, and uh, uh, this is something what can happen during the first and second semester. From the third semester onwards, actually the students can go on progressively taking uh, the courses which are Related in, in the area of inception, elaboration, and transformation. And one of those courses are that I already, uh, in my previous slide, I've mentioned, and we'll be detailing it out when we meet at the workshop. And apart from those courses, it will be supplemented by appropriate projects. We'll take a project in the initial stage, which are, which are essentially trying to build the project skills. Next, you would go for uh, areas that they could uh, have some kind of integrated project, and finally, the capstone project will culminate the uh, project kind of feasibility. So, for this, the institute must be capable, and the institute has to take. Uh, there are many things what institutes can do to build those capabilities, especially in the area of teaching, inspiring, facilitating, and mentoring. Uh, there are uh, what what we could do as an institute. You could have maker spaces. You could have campus accelerators. You can have various kind of mentoring programs, uh, and of course, whole bunch of uh, uh, courses. So all these will be actually elaborating in our workshop uh, when we meet. So how this can be done? Now, of course, I mean we have talked about all this. Uh, how exactly this can be done, and for that we would like to present two case studies where in fact two engineering colleges we have tried to match this framework with whatever is the existing uh, existing state, and we we'll try to identify what do they need to do, where they are lacking capabilities, what additional what additional resources they need to plan for, and how they could come up with a, a long term plan, maybe a five year plan by which they will ultimately integrate uh, entrepreneurship into this. So, evaluate each capability required for integration of entrepreneurship based on the framework proposed, and then prepare a plan for implementation. So, these two case studies will also be presented uh, uh, in the workshop. So, uh, with this, I am concluding for uh, 
I wanted to hear uh, about the capability of artificial intelligence. And uh, I would now pass on to Gopal. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The uh, people in the audience can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yes. OK. So welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar uh, session. And I thank uh, Professor Bapat and also the preceding speakers, um, Mr. Pradeep and Ashok, for talking about the value of entrepreneurship, which we all fervently believe is extremely important. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about what we are doing at the University of Akron, but also what I plan to do when we have the uh, workshop sessions on January 10th. Uh, OK. So the University of Akron is a smaller university in the Midwest in the Ohio region. But however, what we are trying to do is to develop and foster the culture of entrepreneurship uh, that, that the other speakers talked about. And the way we are doing it is going to be very, very practical. Uh, I joined the university from about a year ago uh, from the industry. I've had uh, more than two and a half decades in the industry. And I have been in various areas in the industry where I have been more practical developing products for the automotive industry and for many other consumer industries, working to bring new products to life. In the process, I have been working with many, many entrepreneurs. And I have finally understood a few things a little bit to explain how it is done. And one thing I have understood is entrepreneurship is not about theory. Entrepreneurship is about practice, about how things are done. So I will try to summarize it by saying that we, by saying that I put this together called a 6i process. It is about first inquiring whether a problem opportunity exists. And as you and I know, there are hundreds and thousands of problems that have been solved but still can be made better. Okay, and new problems cope up, come up every day. How we go about it, solving the problem, and realizing it as a commercial opportunity and making a career for yourself is what these workshops are about. We want to foster young minds to make up and come up with new ideas. So that process, after the process of inquiry, okay, we call it ideation. And I'm going to have a workshop on how to create ideas out of problems and opportunities. And we will show you a structured brainstorming and creative method to do that, which we have used at the University of Akron, and which we know will actually yield results. Okay, And within the one hour workshop, we will show you how to form a team, how to brainstorm for ideas in a structured manner. Okay, All of us can make have ideas, but how do you bring out the best one and understand which one is the optimal one? So even though it's it, this is a process that takes several months. At the very least, I will show you how we do it and how you can actually get some results from it. And then once you have come up with a really good solution or an idea, what do you do with it? Many people try and take it to market immediately. But a good way is to actually, when you have an invention, is actually have, protect your intellectual property. And the way you do it is, if it's a unique unique idea, you need to try and file a patent on it. And I will not be talking about the patenting process. You need to know how to do that. However, if it is not a patentable idea, you need to know that you should be the first one on the market to go as quickly as possible before others copy you on that. So once, let us say, you have developed that idea and made a, you know, you know, a thought process that this is valuable, what would you do? And that process I call innovation, taking an idea to fruition. And that process of innovation generally involves many other steps. It will involve, for example, 
taking that idea and making it into some proof of principle and then seeing whether that actually works and then talking to customers to see if there's a need and once you develop that very very good understanding of the marketplace what we normally do is we invest in the idea by going after uh, you know either banks or other people who are believe in your idea and willing to put money into it and once you do all of this you say, oh my God, now I have made an impact. People actually want to buy the product. They want to use it in their day-to-day -day lives. And that I call, you know, being a entrepreneur because finally you've taken that inquiring mind and made it to be impactful in the society. And at the end of the day, if you talk to many, many, many entrepreneurs, they'll say, that is the most satisfying part of my journey. And it is a long journey. So here we go. So in the in the next in the workshop itself, now a few minutes on each of the workshop. The first workshop on ideation and invention. Who is this for? For this is for people in engineering, whether students or faculty. It is for people who want to learn how to come up with good ideas. How do we solve those problems? How do you you know put those ideas in an order? Is the is for example is an idea just a, a clever idea or is it also can it generate money I'll show you how to put together mind maps we'll learn how to you know understand you know how do you add uh, this is called thinking inside the box many times people keep saying keep thinking outside the box but, but the problem is thinking outside the box requires multi-million dollars sometimes of research uh, solving problem solving but many times you can take a simple problem and just solve it okay one one of the examples I give is you know you have seen for example villagers who actually take water you know they walk an hour or so just to get water from a pond uh, recently one of the companies came up with a very simple idea you know just use a barrel or a roller and fill the water at the pond and then drag the roller which with a hollow roller which is which is nicely capped put the water inside and now you can carry five times or ten times the amount of water with less effort and therefore you actually solve the problem which actually existed instead of you know putting the water on top of your head and then carrying it you know five kilometers so using those kind you know coming this this workshop will actually identify those kinds of solutions because you're thinking inside the box there exists one method for solving the problem let's come up with a better method that will actually make it more efficient more cost competitive you know more easy to use so that more people use it and solves a bigger problem so this whole process is then you can take it to the next step which is either protecting your invention or refining your invention and and then going on to the next problem so I'll introduce a method called the TRIZ creativity so the next work uh, after this I will have a short session on what is called proof of concept. At the University of Akron, my job is proof of concept, which is what we do, which is take ideas and inventions and for, and then try to make it into, to see whether it works. You know, you see pictures here of, you know, students in India actually making things. This is what we love about it. So this is saying, hey, does this work? okay does this quadcopter work or this formula work or work but then how do you translate it and say can I make it into a product that people will love for example there is a quadcopter now that can take selfies right you launch it and then you can take pictures of yourself now is that important are people going to buy it I can you make you know crores of rupees doing it so but first step is make it make sure that you can actually make it work that is called proof of principle and then can you make it in a, in a pilot scale and then can you make it in a commercial scale which means thousands and thousands of copies okay so this is how entrepreneurs will I'll show you or t t talk to you about how people build concepts into prototypes and then we'll have a second workshop and the workshop is once again comprised of how do you know customers really want what you make okay this is entrepreneurship 101 okay and it is something which is coming up more and more something that most of you have already known it is called listening to customers now it it appears funny right <laughs> but the business exists only because of customers but you'll be surprised to know that many entrepreneurs forget about customers they came up with a great idea 
they made a beautiful product they think that people want it just because they like it and because they had wanted the need they don't go out and talk to hundreds of people to understand what was the real problem uh, that they needed solved so we have developed a process based on lean launchpad principles on how to talk to customers and this is called listening to customers and uh, and basically this is done by almost like the five why process and asking open-ended questions I will show you a methodology to do that I'll form you into teams and then in the team process we will we will interview each other and understand how to bring out uh, doing behavioral analysis bring out ideas saying okay does this person when he talked to me did he really want it or not okay for example in that water uh, you know transporting water using a pot you know if people actually went out and talked to those people hey what are your problems okay for example that person may have said oh I want to really I, I make six trips I wish I can make it only in one trip if she said that immediately that leads to a better solution as soon as you go back because you're listening to customers so instead of designing it for let us say 100 barrels or 100 pots making that product uh, so much that you have to transport 100 barrels you only design it good enough for six pots because that's all the person the 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 customer will need so listening to customers is a critical part of being an entrepreneur and developing the right focused product for that and that is what we will talk about and what we will try to do in the workshop and I hope that will be useful to you as you go about your journey as entrepreneurs and not only that you'll become successful entrepreneurs because you've nailed what is called a market validation or the customer validation and once you do this I'm sure you'll be more successful by raising money and uh, then developing a product too uh, for customers so thank you very much and uh, if there are any questions I'll be glad to take them hello Yes. Hello. The attendees are requested to type in any questions and the speakers will answer them. The webinar participants still signed in? Yes, we have 31. Okay. So it was clear? There was no problems in the voice? No, no problem. Okay, thank you. Someone asks about government schemes for college students. So this workshop is targeted for faculty. How can it be taken for students? <laughs> 